We'll see how the live stream goes this morning. According to YouTube, I have 22 people watching this video right now, and I seriously doubt that number. So let me go grab something. I'll be right back, and hopefully you get your questions for me when I get back. Now, according to YouTube, I don't have anyone viewing this except for me. Hmm. How odd. Hey, looks like someone finally showed up. So the question is, how do you name a compound with an epoxide ring in it? The honest answer is, I don't know. That's actually not something we really talk about in this course. Um, if it's a homework question, let me know. I might need to get rid of it. But there is a way to name them. I don't think I talk about it at all in the notes, though. Yeah, naming epoxides is not really a chem one concept. Mostly know how to make epoxides from alkenes, but that's it.
discussion board. Oh, my problem won't do epoxide. Let me check. Oh, okay. So it's not actually asking you to name the compound. What it's asking you to do is just identify it as an epoxide. So the first two are aldehydes ketones. The dissimilar product here is just going to be the epoxide. So you don't just have to name the compound. You just have to say that, oh, this forms an epoxide, whereas the other two form ketones. So the school has opted against teaching organic over the summer, and actually it's kind of been free fall right now for organic. We're looking at what to do for the fall for orgo, so we're definitely teaching orgo in the fall. I don't think I got my request to teach orgo too, but that's an argument I'm going to have down the road with my uh, bosses. But yeah, we're definitely not doing orgo over the summer. Two reasons. One, we don't have anyone to teach it. There's no way I could possibly have the course together that fast. The second is that we don't have any labs. We've actually tried very hard to find... So with Chem 1 and Chem 2, there are take-home labs. They're not great, but there are labs kits you can order. With Orgo, because they don't want to deal with shipping hazardous materials, they don't want you working with hazardous materials, they don't want you shipping back hazardous materials, basically most of the labs, take-home labs for organic, are pretty bad. So we're trying to decide what to do, but definitely there's going to be no Orgo tour for the summer. That said, Hannah keep in touch. I can send you my notes. I can send you my packets. Um, you're still always going to have access to my YouTube channel if you're going to need help with that. And just feel free to email me and keep in contact. If you have questions, I'll see what I can do in terms of answering your questions. While I think you said you're going to go to UNC Wilmington. Yeah, we're still around to answer questions if you got them. Do diols follow, follow alcohol naming conditions? Actually, yes. Instead of saying all, we just say diol. So, ignoring stereochemistry, this would be 2, 3, butadiol. And it's still going to sell the same priority rules that the alcohols follow. So if we had three, we would call it a trial and things like that. Um, that said, a lot of the dials, you're going to see a lot of trade names come in. So like eth ethylene glycol, things like that, those will start showing up. So to answer your question, yeah, they follow the exact same name convention. We just do two, three, butadiol. We had four, three, two, three, th two, two, three view to trial, things like that. Now, I don't think the dials show up until Orgo, orgo 2. So right now, we just do simple alcohols, and then we take Orgo 2. We do dials, trials, because those lead into sugars. Sugars are actually polyols. So the something simple like sucrose or fructose, and you're going to get used to drawing these. Like sugars look like this, they have a ton of alcohols attached to them. So the diols and triols kind of feed into this later stuff where we talk about biochemistry with sucrose and fructose and all the types of sugars. But then we kind of get away from this diol trial naming and we start going to like this is sucrose, this is fructose, things like this.
Yeah, no problem, Hannah. Especially at the end of the semester, shoot me an email. If you're going to take it over the summer, I've got the notes ready for or go to. I don't have any packets prepared for or go to, and I don't really have any videos prepared yet. That's kind of the summer plans right now. But yeah, any questions you have, just feel free to shoot me an email, and I'll see what I can do to help you out. Anything, I can make a few more videos where I shout out to you. And yeah, I do understand your concern about taking an Orgo class with over 200 students. That was Orgo 2 for me. I had it with about, had an electro hall with about 200 students. It does, in my opinion, Orgo 2 is easier than Orgo 1. One, the naming kind of fades away. Um, the compounds just get too complicated to name. We start dealing with a lot of trade names. The more intense part are just all the reactions that start showing up. A lot of coupling reactions, and there's the expectation that you still kind of remember a lot from Orgo 1. But yeah, I would say Orgo 2 is much more reaction heavy than it is like naming and stereochemistry, because you're also going to deal with a lot of trigonal planar molecules. So the chiralities kind of disappear for Orgo 2 as well. The only part I found hard with Orgo 2 was just biochemistry. I'm not a biochemistry person, so the sugars, um, switching between the rings versus the chain sugars just didn't do it for me. Probably also didn't help by that point in Orgo 2. I pretty much knew I was passing the class, so I kind of checked out. I think NC State also offers Orgo 2, although I'm surprised any school is offering Orgo right now in the summer because, again, if you can't do the lab, that's kind of the point of organic chemistry is to do the labs. Like, the labs are actually pretty useful when you do organic courses. For Orgo 2, so I had Orgo 1 with a very hard Orgo 1 instructor, and I really, on the one hand, it was good it was a hard course. It was a hard course because it wasn't particularly well taught, but I got really good at organic chemistry because of my Orgo 1 teacher. So Orgo 2 was actually taught by Kay Sandberg. She was an exceptionally good teacher. She taught correctly. It was very, like, you come to lectures, you do the think-pair-share, we engage in class. So, in terms of resources, I didn't really need them, and I hate to say that. It's not that Orgo 2 was so easy, it's just that the course I took was incredibly well taught. So, if you've got the Francis Carey book, that's actually a very good resource. Um, other than that, online videos, Khan Academy, hopefully my notes will help you out. Really find a study group while you're there. That would probably be the best advice. Generally, among two or three of you, you can probably figure out how to solve the problems. But I don't have good advice for you because I went from such a challenge, challenging Orgo 1 teacher to such a very good Orgo 2 teacher that I didn't think Orgo 2 was that hard. But again, I went from an instructor that there was no telling what we were going to get that day to Kay Sandberg, who was very upfront about what the expectations for the course were, what to study, how to study, things like that.
Now, big nice thing is that I think for the most part, Wake Tech's Orgo 1 does actually follow most schools' Orgo 1 pretty well. And our Orgo 2 is supposed to follow, from what I understand, it falls pretty well as well. So the topics that you covered in Organic 1 should be the same topics they would have expected you to take in Orgo 1 before you showed up. So alkanes, alkenes, alkynes. Excuse me, alcohols, alkyl halides, and, and ethers. There is some overlap, and I think that's just kind of inherent to us trying to teach to every course. So ethers show up again in Orgo 2 in our curriculum, even though it's technically an Orgo 1 concept. But yeah, in terms of footing, you should be pretty well prepared for Orgo 2. Generally, what they're going to start you out on are the dienes, the trienes, the polyenes, and the aromatic systems. The hardest part for that is just identifying what's aromatic, what's anti-aromatic, and what's not aromatic. And there's a few rules for it. There is a little bit of witchcraft, particularly when it comes to lone pairs, but hopefully my notes will clear that up for you. And then, let's see. Ketones and aldehydes will eat up a good third of the course. They're interesting, but then you start beginning to realize what a witch's brew it all ends up becoming, especially when you start getting to things where the aldehydes and ketones start reacting with each other. And then the other big chunk of your course is going to be Grignards. They're interesting, but it was interesting to talk to my um, coworker Peter. Peter was actually an organic chemist before he got into teaching, and for him, Grignards are cool, but they're horribly impractical, and it's weird that we commit so much time talking about them when, in practice, you would never really use them, because in terms of industrial scale, they're just not practical. They're super dangerous compounds, they're super toxic compounds, and they're super aggressive compounds. So you have to have specialized reactors to work with them. So you're going to go through a whole test on Grignard reagents, which you probably will never ever practically use at the bench. Especially at the undergraduate level, because they are super air and water reactive. Well, there aren't any really questions today. I mean, I know the exam's next week, and usually this would just be a reserve day for, like, going over in-class problems and in-class reviews. We can definitely end the live stream early today. So if I don't see any questions in the next minute or two, we'll just end the live stream. Again, send me emails. I mean, um, you can message me through Teams. If you've got questions, remember that the homework is going to be your test for exam, so make sure you're working on that. Feel free to ask me questions about the homework. This is not something that you have to do on your own. Particularly, don't burn through your submissions. So if you use submission one or two and you're like, ah, I don't know, I don't want to burn through it, just send me an email on my end. It's a little bit clunky, but I can definitely see what your answer is and what the answer is supposed to be. And kind of get you there. Yeah, to any anyone taking my courses, you are free to my resources. Like they're not something I try to keep a you know tight lid on. The only thing I don't really give out are the solution keys, and that's just so my students down the road aren't camping out with my solution keys. But yeah, if you ever want, like even if you go to the university and you ask, send me an email saying, "Do you have copies of this?" I can send you what resources I have. Like I don't see a reason to like not give this to you. So please, feel, any of you, feel free to ask. If you go and take Organic to another school, please email me. I can send you my packets. I can send you my notes. I've got videos on my website for what they're worth. So please feel free to ask for any help. I personally, and most instructors will hopefully tell you this, is that the goal here is that we want you to succeed. Like If you, do, if you fail a course, we'd rather you fail it because you genuinely don't understand the material, but not because we were malicious and went after you. So yeah, we do want to see you succeed down the road. We do want to see you do well in your careers. And hope the other thing it provides us with is that if you tell us how things are working out for you down the road, 
it gives us an idea of how to improve our curriculum on our end because and unfortunately you kind of see this with the chem one chem two instructors and i hate i'm not trying to trash on them but it's something i noticed when i went from teaching just chem one to teaching chem one and chem two when you see how it plays out down the road you begin to understand how your earlier instructor earlier instructions didn't help so if you look at how i used to teach chem one versus how i teach it now it's much more geared towards my chem two students because I understand not every Chem 1 student goes on to Chem 2, but those who do go on to Chem 2 really need that help. Same thing's gonna be true for organic. It helps me to know down the road where you all were struggling when you hit Orgo 2, so I can better prep my Orgo 1 students for when they go take Orgo 2. So yeah, please, all of you, keep in contact. Let me know what helped, let me know what didn't help, and this way I can dial in my resources. This is my first semester teaching it, so, and you can kind of see like the growing pains. I thought these four tests were, these five tests were pretty evenly divided. Now it looks like the first test was like super intensive and everyone after that kind of fell off to get successively easier. Not a bad thing, but it tells me I need to kind of spread out my lectures more. And this was true of Chem 2. When I used to teach Chem 2, it used to be equal time for everything. Now when I teach Chem 2, there's a huge chunk cut out for thermo and equilibrium because it's such an important concept. Whereas the first test material, I give maybe two, two and a half weeks before I start testing on it because I don't need three weeks to teach it. Give you about another five minutes, and if you don't have any questions, we'll head on out. So peroxides are so reactive because they are such frustrated rings. So if you look at your peroxide ring, this angle here is gonna be roughly 60 degrees. Ideally, it would be 109.5 degrees. Because this is a technically supposed to be a tetrahedral carbon. So there's this massive ring string associated with this bridging oxygen. And anything we can do to break that bridging oxygen will generally increase the stability of the compound. Now you may ask why in the world do they even form in the first place? Big thing here is the oxidation of oxygen. Oxygen is taking electrons away from carbon. So there is stability imparted by the bond but there's also a instability imparted by the bond strain. So epoxides can exist and they can exist at room temperature just fine, but there's definitely better configurations it would rather be in. So one example is that if you add water to this, you actually get the diol. And we can remove it by removing the water. So if we add a really good agent for removing water, we can suddenly recreate this epoxide. But given the option of not existing, the epoxides would rather not exist. 
They're not horribly unstable, but they're definitely not as stable as something like a, a visceral dial. A second, move over. There we go. Yeah, you're welcome. Nutshell is just that bond strain makes them unstable. I, mean, I think epoxides are another concept we talk much more about or go to. We talk about how to make them here or go to. We talk a lot more about reactions of them and how to work with them. But again, I don't really think the naming shows up that much. If I remember correctly, the naming is something really weird for epoxides. You're welcome. Sort of suspicious a lot of you are working on the homework right now and you're kind of like going through to find problems that you don't know so you can just kind of ask questions. Which, you know, good strategy. Give you a few more minutes, and if you're good, we're good. Oh, so just chime in. Chemistry behind it. Well, it's much more biochemistry. Um, maybe we can talk about the cheese making for about five more minutes. It's actually so. Right now, I've got four rinds of cheese up and running. So this is actually the most recent one that got put up. So this is the most recent cheese that got made up. It's a 
Jarlsberg, which is like Swiss, but not exactly like Swiss. For those of you interested in cheese making, the hardest part is getting a cheese press. It's the most expensive part of the operation. I mean, the cultures aren't cheap, but they're not, you know, the $200 you got to pay for a press. Or in my case, my dad had an old cutting board that he repurposed. But in terms of cheeses, you've got mesophilic versus thermophilic, which, as their name implies, depends on the temperature. Mesophilics are made about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Thermophilics are made about 100 degrees Fahrenheit in terms of the curd temperatures. Um, there are some amazing books on cheese making. Artisan cheese making is the one I would recommend if you're trying to get into it. It's very much these are the recipes, and the intro section is pretty short and sweet and to the point about how to make cheeses. I have a much more thorough book. It's not a recipe book so much as a techniques book saying, well, here's how you get the certain flavor profiles and things like this. At the end of the day, and I've recently talked to somebody about this, they were like, well, you know, how do you make the different kinds of cheeses? The reality is they're all really kind of made the same way. Heat the milk, add the, add the bacteria to it, to it, give the bacteria about 45 minutes to an hour to get going, add the rennet. The rennet is an enzyme that polymerizes the cheese proteins to actually give you the curds. Usually you do some type of treatment of the curds and then press the cheese and let it ripen. Now, the flavor you get depends on the type of mesophilic cultures you use or the thermophilics you use. There are lipase powders. The ASE implies that this is an enzyme. The enzyme actually breaks down parts of the milk to create a flavor profile akin to sheep's or goat's milk. You can put uh, other types of mold in there. So there's a lot of bacteria you put in there to give you the camemberts versus the breeze versus the blue cheeses. Which, by the way, I would not recommend blue cheese as a star cheese. They're delicious. I've yet to successfully make one. Two reasons. The cultures are super expensive. So they're $30 a bag versus like $10 a bag for the mesophilix. Also, the blue cheese gets everywhere. So you kind of have to have specialized equipment for it. But anyway, I have made the bloom ripened cheeses. They're hard, definitely worth it because they're super cheap compared to what you're going to buy in the store. But anyway, to get the different flavors of cheese, if you're super like hardcore hipster about it, the big thing, it depends on what the cow was eating. Most milk you buy in the store is homogenized for a reason. You, when you buy milk from the store, you kind of want it to taste like milk. If you go to a dairy farm, they'll tell you it depends on what the cow's eating, where the cow is in terms of her lactation. So spring milk is not the same as fall milk. We homogenize it so it is, but if you really want to get into like the hipster flavor profiles, you actually need to get into a farmer, and I'm not to that point in my life yet. As for the beer brewing, we used to have a department head, Danny Monroe. He's actually over at NC State now in the biotech. He used to do collaboration work with local brewers, actually engineering their, their yeast lines. I used to be a lot more hardcore into beer brewing. That was in grad school when I was brewing like a batch every two every month or two. Now I'm probably doing two batches a year. I've got my leftover recipes from when I was doing it so often. Super good beer recipes. I'm not as hardcore into that. Two reasons. One, beer making kind of follows a stage of progression. So the first beer kit you buy, it's about 150 bucks. Everything you need. And you usually go with the beer kits. And the beer kits are really nice. You will get a good beer. It may not be a great beer, but it is a good beer out of the beer batch. Then you kind of go through the progression. You're like, well, I want to start doing recipes now. I don't want to get a kit. I want to actually like buy the ingredients. So that's stage two. And you still got the same equipment you did before, but you're doing stage two. Stage three is where you start kind of designing your own recipes. And then the next step up is stage four, where you have fermenters specific to the type of beer you're making. And I got to that stage. I actually have a beer for a fermenter for dark beers and a fermenter for light beers. Then you kind of need to go into the I want top fermenting versus bottom fermenting yeast, and I want to do secondary fermentation, so I ferment it once, strain it off, ferment it again. Was not willing to commit that type of money. Oh, cow raising is one of those things you don't want to get into. Um, so I learned the history of veal doing cheese making. Um, it's really kind of interesting. I personally don't eat veal. Um, I view it for moral reasons. I don't think there is a reason anymore to eat veal. It made sense back in the day. The idea was that the whole reason you had a cow was it was very good at converting grass and things that we couldn't eat into usable food that we could. 
So it's like chickens, right? Chickens eat crickets. In principle, we could eat crickets, but chickens taste a lot better. So they're very good at converting land resources into something that's edible. Well, for a cow to lactate, she has to give birth. And so back in the day, what they would do was they would get the cow pregnant and then they would abort um, the field cow. And that's where veal came from was that, and honestly, it sounds barbaric. It was actually quite humane because if you're drinking the milk, the calf isn't. So either the calf was going to starve to death or you were going to kill the calf and eat it and drink the milk. So you may not view it as ethical, but it kind of made sense in the context of what they were doing. The whole reason they had the cow was for the milk. And if they were going to drink the milk, the calf wasn't, the calf was going to die. So they viewed it as kind of like a merciful way of getting the cow pregnant without killing, you know, without having a calf starve to death. Raising cows, you still have to get the cow pregnant and she'll lactate for two years and then she has to get pregnant again. So if you want to do a cow directly, you're going to have to get her pregnant. You're going to have to abort her fetus and you'll still get the milk, but it's far easier just to go to the store and buy it. And yes, I realize you can get super hipster and like buy certain types of milk. Honestly, the stuff at Trader Joe's works just fine. I've actually made really good cheeses. The bigger thing is not the milk. I mean, the milk's important. The bigger thing are the cultures you're working with and how you treat them. So if you do a really good do job of drying out the cheese, of brining it correctly, then you're gonna come up with a really good cheese even if you're using super cheap milk. But yeah, the bigger thing I would get in contact with is somebody who has the ability to build you a cheese press for pretty cheap. There are designs online but yeah, your cheese press is going to be the hardest burden to entry. If you want to start easy, you can do like mozzarella, feta, things like that. That can be done in a basket. They're fine. That's what I started with. That said, for me, it was a constant nagging reality that you just spent two weeks making mozzarella. It tastes good, but you can buy a bag for like three bucks at the store. And it's there and it's ready to go and it's already shredded. So more I kind of got into cheeses that I knew that you couldn't buy. So... One of the cheese, cheese I made in January was a cheddar, but it's a cheddar with chives blended into it. So when it finally ripens after not after 12 months, it'll be a very sharp cheddar with that onion back with that onion aftertaste to it. I'm trying to think of the other ones. I've got Parmesan there. It should be a good Parmesan, but again, you can kind of buy Parmesan, so I wasn't like super big on making that one. Um, another crowd pleaser is I have an Asiago Papado. So the Asiago is like this really creamy white cheese but it's got peppercorns in it, so it's also got that spice to it as well. But that's more if you want to get into cheese making, super great Christmas gifts, because you take one of those two pounds of cheese, cut it in quarters, bring it to family gatherings, or give it out to people. The nice thing about cheese, generally it tastes good. You're not giving them that much, and if they throw it away, they don't feel bad about throwing it away because it's food. And families usually impressed, like, oh, it's homemade cheese. Especially, if, like, I have hipster family in California. I shouldn't say hipster family. I've got bougie family in California. And so they love it when they get, like, the artisan cheeses because they can talk about how much better it is in France or how much better it is in Spain. But, yeah, I would recommend cheese making. It's really fun. Beer making, too. Like, beer making is just a college tradition. And hopefully it will teach you the difference between, like, good beer and bad beer so the rule I was taught is that if the beer comes if the beer comes in a screw top bottle it's not good beer if it doesn't take a can it doesn't take a bottle opener to get into it it's not good beer and that's pretty good metric the one I would not recommend is wine wine is unforgiving wine takes you a year to realize you screwed up beer you'll know pretty quick
Actually, let me go grab my cheese bake books. I'll be right back. So Hannah has a copy of it. So this is your pretty, this is actually a very good book for making cheeses. I will admit some of her details are not the best, but definitely if you're going to get into cheese making, this is the book you want to get, Artisan Cheese Making at Home by Mary Carlin. First part of it does a really good job of just basically establishing techniques. There's just, again, there's little nuances that she forgot to put in this book. There's also some bad wording. So it says dry for two days or until dry to the touch. You can read that two ways, either two days is the cutoff or it's dry to the touch. Dry to the touch needs to be the cutoff you work with. The second book is Mastering Artisan Cheesemaking, and this is by Giannox, Giannis Cliss Caldwell. It is the science of how to make cheese, but in terms of practical recipes, it's not any of that. A lot of it is very much like how to modify your techniques to get certain flavor profiles. It's much more of an intermediate to expert level book. I would not recommend it if you're not at that level. Because she does do a whole opening about how polymerization works, how the fats get embedded into it. It's interesting, but honestly, you can find a lot of that on Wikipedia or you can find that on the internet. This book, the actual cheese making book, these are actual like recipes on how to make cheese. So you actually get direct ingredients, directions, and things like that. And she does a very good job. She starts out with how to make yogurt, like really basic stuff that doesn't even require mold or press. And then she moves into stuff that isn't that are non-pressed cheeses, hard cheeses, and then she goes into the rind, the um, rind ripened cheeses. Rind ripened, particularly in North Carolina, is super hard because blue mold does naturally exist in the air here. It is not the blue mold that is in blue cheese. It's a different kind of blue mold. It tastes like mildew. It is super hard to do bloom ripened cheeses in North Carolina. I lived in California when I was doing this. It's super easy to do because it's a dry Mediterranean climate and there's no mold. So you can easily do like a camembert or a brie, something like that in California. Out here, it's a bit more touchy. I'm gonna try it in December. I think if you do it in the winter months when the blue mold is gone, and this is from doing the mushroom research, where we found in the winter months, the blue mold didn't affect our plates nearly as quickly, you might be able to pull it off. Now, one thing they do emphasize in these books, and it's hard to do on a budget, temperature control. They say, oh, ripen in 50 degree Fahrenheit weather for like three days. Well, unless you got a dedicated mini fridge for this, I'm ripening them right now in the closet in this room. Works just fine. As long as you don't let them get much above 80 or much below 60, you may not get the control you want over the flavor profile, but you're definitely going to get a good flavor profile. The worst one I ever had was that I had cheese I stuck on a high shelf. And this is California, they don't believe in any type of controls for keeping your apartment hot or cold. My cheese actually baked on that cabinet, and when I peeled the wax off of it, all the liquid poured out from where it had baked all the liquid out of the cheese. So, at least in North Carolina, we have air conditioning and like heat pumps. So yeah, your closet will work just fine, as long as the temperature doesn't swing too much. Also, waxing is super fun. It gets everywhere, but yeah, waxing cheese is actually pretty cool. Now the other nice thing was that I got in cheese making after I did beer making, so I actually had leftover beer making. So the big thing you need is an enormous stock pot for making the cheese. Well, I had an enormous stock pot for making the beer, so I just bought a new beer stock pot because I didn't quite like the one I had. It was like that $150 kit that you get. So I bought like a nice $50 like canning pot that can actually handle the volumes of beer you work with. So yeah, I think for about a 50 to 100 bucks, you can probably get started with cheese making, assuming you can get someone who can get you a hold of a press.
But check Craigslist. I haven't done that in a while. Probably after all this quarantine, you're going to find a lot of people who have a lot of stuff they're selling on Craigslist because they tried to entertain themselves during quarantine. And now that they've gone back, they don't really have time for it anymore. Also, Cheese Supplies, New England Cheese Supply. Fantastic place to buy your cheese cultures from. I highly recommend them. They're run by people that I realize they're in New England. They sound and act just like they're from the Midwest. So it's that super, like, they send you a monthly moose letter, not a newsletter, but M-O-O-S. It's cute in, like, that Midwest kind of humor way. They're very competitive on their prices, so. If you decide to get in brew, brew bearing while you're in Raleigh, I really recommend Atlantic Brew Supply off of Hillsborough Street. Super competitive on their prices and probably going to be cheaper than anything else you can find anywhere else. So I think they have an intro kit that's like 100 bucks and it has absolutely everything you're going to need. And the beer making kits are like 20 bucks. Pro tip, particularly because you're college students, if you want beer bottles, go raid the recycling bins on a college campus. You're bound to find a few that aren't screw top. Actually, no. Um, so if you dry cheese correctly, um, it'll be soft, it'll be dry to the touch, and you'll squeeze it and feel a little bit rubbery. Once you wax it, it doesn't smell anymore. I've only had a couple that have, and they were basically rotting in the wax. I didn't let them dry out fast enough, or let them dry out long enough. I thought I had, but it was just the weather I was dealing with. But generally speaking, if you close the closet doors and you keep it sealed for like a few weeks and you open up, you're going to kind of smell that aroma of cheese but there's very little smell associated with cheese making. Um, actually, the weird thing is you'll make the cheese and I've tried the curds. They taste like milk. They don't have any flavor to them. It actually takes a long time for that profile to develop. You're gonna find you're not the only one that raids them, actually. I learned this from my roommate in grad school. who you, He was an avid brew beer, beer brewer for a very long time. Um, he and I didn't quite see eye to eye on beer brewing, but like he was super hardcore about it. Um, but yeah, don't, like beer bottles aren't expensive. They're like a dollar a bottle, but seriously, if you're on a college campus, just go raid them. Like the only thing for me was I didn't have a parking permit. So it's getting to the point it was obvious what I was doing. You have a college parking permit, go raid the recycling bins. You have complete justification for doing this. So yeah, go rate them. Save yourself the money. I used to get people to give me their old beer bottles. And another pro tip, OxyClean takes beer labels right off. So get a five gallon bucket from Home Depot, put your bottles in it, put some hot water in there with about a scoop of OxyClean, come back in about five minutes and most of the labels will peel right off. And by the way, you reuse bottles. You can you reuse them until they finally break. So I've had bottles I've had for like years now because as long as you keep them clean and keep them in the OxyClean between that when you wash them, they're good forever. Even if society shuts down, as long as you can get a hold of the grains and the yeast, you can continue to brew beer indefinitely without any new supplies of glass. But yeah, no one's going to blame you if you steal glass bottles from recycling bins. Like, they're going to be kind of proud of you, actually. Like, you're not just recycling, you're reusing. You're closing the loop.
You're very welcome. Getting the hobbies, they're a ton of fun. Like cheese making can take up a lot of space, beer making can take up a lot of space, but honestly, all of that fits into a box about you know that wide, that tall, that deep. And the only time it really occupies space is when I'm letting things dry or press. But yeah, go for it. Have a ton of fun with life. Like you gotta have something to do when you're not like in classes and studying. All right, so that looks kind of like in the questions for today. So um, let's see what I said about next week. I know at some point you got an exam next week. Let's see what the next live stream is. So Tuesday, we do not have a live stream because I'm just going to give you, I mean, I'll be around via Teams. If you really want to talk, we can. I can do a live stream if you want it, but your exam is due at the start of class, not at the end of class. So keep that in mind, but you'll see that on the homework due date anyway. So just to kind of give you a reprieve, we're not going to really have a live stream. The following Thursday, we will. We're going to get into alkynes and ethers. I assure you they're the easiest thing we're going to cover this semester. And then we're into final exam territory. I will send you more information about the final exam. I'm still weighing what to do. I do want the homework to be considered part of the final exam. That said, I also kind of want to give you something that's cumulative as well. So I'm trying to weigh how to make that happen. But that's what next week is for. So thanks to the few of you that were able to show up today. Um, again, shoot me emails. Keep up with the class. Once you get done here, again, feel free to keep in contact if you go and take or go to someplace else. Otherwise, I will see you all next week.